So we're going to talk a little bit now about an introduction to thermodynamics. Here's section 5.2. Imagine that we have three containers. They could be like little coffee cups or glasses or beakers. And they have some solution in them. So something like salt water, perhaps. Water or sugar dissolved in the water. And in the first one, uh, we just have an open container. It's just open at the top. So that means that the environment outside the container can interact with the environment on the inside. So we could boil this, for example, and the water would boil off. We call this an open system. The system is the coffee cup with all the solution inside of the cup there. That's called an open system. And what we would claim is that matter and energy can pass between the system and surroundings. Okay, again, the surroundings are outside. The system is in the inside there. Okay, so matter and energy can transfer. Heat can come in and out. Um, matter can come in and out. Now consider the second uh, the second coffee cup. The one in the middle has essentially a lid on it. We've put something on top to seal it. And what this does is it doesn't keep heat from flowing in or out, but it does keep the water from boiling away. So we call this a closed system. And a closed system, it just allows energy to pass between the system and the surroundings. So think about it. Imagine that you've got a glass cup and you have really, really hot water on the inside. If you touch that cup, you're going to get really hot. You're going to get burned because heat is able to flow through the walls of the container. So heat can come in and out, but matter can't come in and out because we put a lid on it. So we can't boil this water off. Now, imagine the third system over here on the right. And what we do is we take the one in the middle, the closed system, but then we put a really good insulative jacket here. This is an insulator, like a thermos cup. got a good insulator on the outside. What we would do is we'd say that in this case, because it has an insulator, the flow of heat in and out is really, really slow. It could even take a day or two. So essentially, there's almost no flow of heat. We have a lid on top. We've sealed it off at the top, so it's closed as well. But now we would claim that not only can matter not pass, but energy can't pass through the walls, or at least it passes at such a slow rate we don't have to worry about it. We call this an isolated system. An isolated system is one in which neither heat nor matter can pass. Okay, neither one. Okay, that's called a an isolated system. So there's three types. There's open, closed, and isolated. Okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about the idea of what are called states. And from that, state functions. So to do this, let's imagine the following. Imagine that you have a balloon, a helium balloon at sea level. Okay? And at sea level, the pressure, the air pressure, let's call it air pressure 
is one ATM, one standard atmosphere. That's the pressure that we would experience at sea level. And let's say the temperature is 20 degrees C, a nice cool but not cold day. That would be called a state. That balloon is said to be in a state. The gas in the balloon is said to be a state. In a state, it has a volume. The, vo the balloon has a volume. The balloon has a pressure. And it also has a temperature. That's what we'll call state one. Okay. Now imagine you accidentally let the balloon go and it goes up really, really high. So it starts climbing all the way up. In fact, it climbs all the way up until it gets up to some very high altitude. And this balloon is now in a place where the air pressure is 0.25 atmospheres. It's dropped down by a factor of three quarters, right? It's gone from one to 0.25. That's a lot lower air pressure. And let's say the temperature is now minus 40 degrees C. Okay. We would now say that that balloon is in a different state. It's under different conditions. So we'll call this state two. Okay. So a state is a set of conditions that this system is under. So the balloon, the helium in the balloon is a system, and it's in the context of surroundings, right? The air outside of the balloon, those are the surroundings. In the first state, it has a relatively high pressure and a relatively high temperature. In state two, up at a high altitude, it has a low pressure and a low temperature, certainly lower temperature, okay? So those are called states. Now it turns out that there are certain conditions that are independent of the path we take to get them there. So there's certain what we call variables, things that we can change, right? That do not depend on the path we take to get to a specific point. Okay? So for example, what are some variables? Well, one variable is temperature. And we'll use the symbol capital T for temperature. It turns out that if we start off at, I'm sorry, 20, deg 20 degrees C, that's what we started off at, and then took it somewhere through the desert where it went up to 40 degrees C, and then brought it back down to uh, some other location where it was minus 40 degrees C, okay? There's a particular path that we're taking, going from 20 to negative 40 to, I'm sorry, 20 to positive 40 to negative 40. Suppose we did what we did over here, though. We said we're just going to go straight from 20 to negative 40. What we would claim is that when the balloon is at this high altitude and the temperature is minus 40, the temperature is independent of what happened historically. It doesn't matter that the temperature used to be 20 or it used to be 40. The temperature of negative 40 degrees C is independent of any history that occurred. Okay? That's all we mean by this. So we're going to call that a state function. A state function is a variable like temperature that does not depend on the path we take to get there, okay? Seems kind of obvious, right? But it turns out it's an important issue when we talk about thermodynamics, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I make a little list here of what are called state functions. And again, these are variables that do not depend on the path we take to get there. 
So temperature is one of them. Another one is pressure. And we're going to use the symbol P for that. So it doesn't matter what the history of the pressure was. It could have been, you know, 10% less yesterday or 10% more yesterday. The pressure today is what it is, and it doesn't matter what it was before. Another example is, um, well, volume. With a V. Okay. So the volume of the balloon, think of a balloon. You could blow it up. You could deflate it, blow it up, deflate it. If the balloon was really big before and then you suck some of the air out and it got smaller, it could be this new volume or it could have been that it was never very big. It was small in the past, but now you blew some more and so it got bigger. So it doesn't really matter whether the balloon did this. Got really big and then got really small or got really small and then got that big. These two volumes are independent of what they were originally. Okay, we call those state functions. Now it turns out there are certain quantities that are not state functions and those are called path functions. And examples of that are heat, and the symbol we'll use for that is a lower Q, and work, and the symbol for that is a lowercase w. Okay? So state functions versus path functions. All right? Now, let's clear up some room here. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about something called the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, first law. The first law of thermodynamics says the following, that if you have a system and let's imagine, just for simplicity, a collection of gas particles, a gas. And those gas particles are bouncing around inside the container, a balloon. Okay, We're going to call this our system. The system is that gas inside the balloon. What we're going to do is we're going to claim that the gas has energy, and we're going to call that internal energy. And the symbol that we're going to use for your textbook is a capital U. Okay, Internal energy is a capital U. What we're going to claim is the following. The internal energy is a result of kinetic energy of all the molecules bouncing around, which is thermal energy. If you increase the temperature, they'll move faster so they have more internal energy. It's also the attractions of the molecules for each other and the attractions of the nuclei to the electrons in the molecules that are in this gas. And we're going to call that the internal energy. And now what I'm going to claim is suppose that we're, we add heat. which is really thermal energy. Okay, we heat it up. The gas will now have more internal energy. So heating a gas will add energy to it. So the internal energy will increase. Okay? So that means there's a change in the internal energy. So we're going to talk about changes now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to claim that the change in internal energy when we heat the gas, they're now moving around faster. I'm going to call that delta U. And we're going to use this symbol quite a bit, delta. 
This means change in. Okay, delta U is the final amount of internal energy. The amount of internal energy it has after you heat it minus the initial internal energy. The amount of internal energy it has at the beginning. So the process is it has a certain amount of internal energy, you heat it, and now it has more internal energy. So that would be the final, okay? Now it turns out that this sort of thing happens quite a bit. It's very useful to think in terms of these situations. And I'm gonna also make one following claim here, is that internal energy is an example of a state function. It's not a path function, it's a state function. Okay, and that's an important distinction to make. That's one of the reasons it's useful for us is because it is, in fact, the state function, okay? So it doesn't matter if we add 20, uh, some 20 units of energy and then take away 40 or immediately take away 20. What matters is the final state minus the initial state, okay? And that's called internal energy. Now, it's not that unuseful. I mean, not that um, it's, it is useful. Let me phrase it that way. It is useful to think of internal energy in the following way. We have surroundings, which is outside the balloon. And then inside the balloon, we have a system. And if the internal energy of the system is increasing, it's because energy is coming from the surroundings into the system. The system cannot create energy itself, okay? So if you have, for example, a battery, a battery cannot charge itself, right? Be nice if it could, right? If you have a battery, you've got to plug it into something, right? You have to plug it into a power supply, a power source, in order to recharge that battery. A battery which is not connected to the surroundings is incapable of recharging. Okay? The same is true for this gas. This gas cannot increase the amount of internal energy it has unless that energy comes from the surroundings. Likewise, the system can release energy to the surroundings, but if it does so, it loses energy. And this is the reason that the idea of a perpetual motion machine is a Im physical impossibility. If the system produces or releases energy to the surroundings, it will now have less energy than it did at the beginning unless you're putting energy into it in some way. So this is an important calculation that we'll use for this, this idea, and that is that the change in internal energy of the system plus the change in internal energy of the surroundings has got to be equal to zero. Any energy that goes into the system has to come from the surroundings. So just to put in the numbers, if you increase the amount of internal energy of the system, so make that plus 20, the only way for this to add up to zero is for the change in the internal energy of the surroundings to be minus 20, right? plus 20 and minus 20 is zero. They have to be opposite of each other. So what we could do is we could write it this way. The change in internal energy of the system is equal to the negative of the change of the internal energy of the surroundings. First law of thermodynamics, okay? Now, what I'm gonna do is point out that we're gonna look in more detail at this a little bit later. But there are two ways, two common ways to affect 
the amount of internal energy of a system. So the internal energy of a system can change in two different ways. One is we can add or remove thermal energy. Heat, we call that. When thermal energy is removed or thermal energy is added, we call that heat flow. Heat is energy changes caused by temperature differences. Okay, so if two regions of space have different temperatures, high temperature, low temperature, and they come into contact with each other, thermal contact, heat will flow from the hotter to the colder. That's the direction it will flow. Hotter to colder. Okay? So the heat flowing into the cold region flows from the hot region. So that's one way you can change the internal energy of a system. Another way is through what's called work. And work is a mechanical or electrical flow of energy or transfer of energy. Okay? So in other words, a battery can run a light. So if you have a battery and you hook that up to a light, that's electrical work being done. Or we could take an object and we could look at, lift it up against gravity. This object has mass. If we move it up this way, this is called mechanical work. So those are two examples of work. So change in internal energy of a system is equal to the sum of these two quantities. The amount of heat that flows into or out plus the amount of work that's done on or by the system. Let's talk a little bit about the terminology here. It's all very important, the terminology here. And we would say the following. If heat, which is Q, flows out of the system, We call this exothermic, and the sign, the mathematical sign of that is negative. The heat flow is negative, and we call that exothermic. If the heat flow is into the system, we call this endothermic. and the sign for that is a plus, okay? Now, in terms of work, if work is done on the system, then the sign for that is positive. If work is done by the system, then that's negative. This is our chemistry convention. It's called a sign convention. Work, the sign convention for work is different in engineering. It's actually the reverse. When work is done on the system, the change is negative. And when, when work is done by the system, it's positive. And the equation is delta U system equals Q minus W. But uh, we won't worry about that for here. Okay?
So this is one way to imagine these possible processes occurring. Imagine you've got a container, and we'll look at this in more detail in the next section. And there's a gas in here, gas molecules, little particles bouncing around inside here. And we take a flame, a Bunsen burner. Okay. Adding heat, right? That's adding heat. Okay. On the other hand, imagine We have the gas, and we put it into a freezer. You would be removing heat. Okay. Now, in terms of work, the most common example that we observe in general chemistry is that of a gas piston. So let's talk real briefly about the gas piston. We'll see this more in the next section. The gas piston is a famous example of work. And it's a very practical one because essentially it's the principle behind the operation of an internal combustion engine. A gas piston is a cylinder. Okay. And the cylinder has a movable membrane. And this membrane can move either up or it can move down, depending on the forces applied. So if you apply a larger force down than is being applied up, the piston will move down, right? if this force here pushing down is greater than this force pushing up. On the other hand, if it's the opposite situation, if the uh, membrane is right there and we apply a larger force up and a smaller force down, then the piston will move up, or the membrane will move up. Okay, so this is a three-dimensional object. It's a it's a cylinder, so it has a volume, and the volume of a cylinder is the cross-sectional area, which is a circle. And the area of a circle is pi r squared, where r is the radius, radius r, times the height. Okay, so times the height. So any time that the force inside the cylinder is greater than the force outside the cylinder, or vice versa, the volume will change because the height of that membrane will change. So if you start, for example, with the membrane down here, that's a small volume. On the other hand, if there's a mismatch in the forces and the membrane moves up here, now you have a large volume. Okay, so what we'll do in the next section is we'll take a look at how that affects um, that situation, how that affects energetics.